You met the new king yesterday. Mm. What did he say to you, if we can ask? Well, of course, I'll, I'll keep my comments there very, very general because uh, um, we always try to keep in, in close confidence the conversations we're lucky enough to have with His Majesty. But the overriding sentiment was just the gratitude for the great effort that people were putting into coming and paying their respects. And by that, I mean not just leaders, but people. Uh, you could see that um, it meant a huge amount to have seen the sheer scale and outpouring of people's love and affection for Her Late Majesty. And you were part of that. Mm. You went to Westminster Hall to see the lying in state yourself. What was going through your mind at that moment to pay your own tribute, but also to be among these thousands of people who've come to Westminster? The sheer silence of that space uh, is, I think, one of the things that makes it so moving. But alongside that, uh, observing as you do that you're standing there alongside uh, members of the public who, mm -hmm. have, who have queued and waited as much as 20 uh, plus hours to be there to share that same moment that you're having. Amongst everything else, I think the thing that I will take away from, from this, this period uh, is just uh, the, the beauty of the public's response. Um, the kindness that you see um, from members of the public, the patience, the camaraderie, that has been for me the most moving tribute of all has been the public response of the British people. And I know you lived in London once upon a time. Yes. Are you surprised by what you see? You know, you know this country well. Has I it taken you? It doesn't surprise me at all, but I think um, what it does is give me that sense of contrast. You know, I've. Mm. Uh, I've seen what London looks like day to day and what it feels like day to day, the hustle and, and, and bustle, uh, and to see it just stand still, um, but do so so poetically is a very moving thing to witness. But it's also the most fitting tribute I can think of. Uh, the Queen was, um, was here for her people and now her people are there for her. And she was also, you know, there having those very important relationships with leaders like you from around the world. Let's talk about your relationship with the Queen. I mean, you first met her in 2018. Mm. I think we can see a picture of you meeting her for the first time when you were expecting your first child. Quite pregnant, do yes, you, as you can see. <laughs> do you remember what she said to you then? Oh, I do, I do. I remember, I remember the, con the first conversation that, that we had before um, the uh, reception. We, we had the ability to have a, a conversation between her and myself and my partner, Clark. Um, I asked her, for instance, of course, what was one of the things on my mind alongside being a, a new prime minister was being a prime minister and a mama. When you think about leaders who have been in that position, there was Benazir mm. Bhutto, there was myself, but before that, there was the Queen. Mm. And there were so few to look to, and so I said to her, how did, you, how did you manage? And I remember she just said, well, you just get on with it. And that was actually probably the best and most, uh, I think, factual advice I could have. You do, you just take every day as it comes, and she did. Um, but I have such respect for her because I see now what it takes to be a mum and a leader, and she did it more times over than, than I. You've expressed great affection for, for the Queen, um, but in terms of the relationship between our two countries, mm. there were occasionally protests when she visited New Zealand some years ago. And, and you say now that it is inevitable that New Zealand will become a republic in your lifetime. Why do you say that? You know, I think even the Queen herself has a, a observed and acknowledged the evolution over time in our relationships. In fact, when she, when she came uh, to New Zealand several decades ago, she herself acknowledged that the treaty between uh, Indigenous New Zealanders, Māori and the Crown, had been imperfectly observed. Mm -hmm. That simple observation is still spoken of today because it demonstrated that she was reflecting back mm -hmm. her observation of the reality and, and um, of uh, New Zealanders' lives. And so uh, my, um, certainly, and this is just simply my observation, my observation is that there will continue to be an evolution in our relationship. Mm -hmm. I don't um, believe it will, be, uh, it will be quick or soon, but over the course of, of my lifetime. But how then and, and when? Because it's one yeah. thing to say, or it, it, you feel that that's the sense of direction, but how, how and when? And this is one of, I think, for New Zealand, a major consideration, of course, mm -hmm. is because we have complex arrangements. Mm -hmm. The Treaty of Waitangi, a very important founding document for, uh, for Aotearoa New Zealand, signed between Māori and the Crown. These are, this is why uh, it's not a process 
um, I have any intent of instigating, mm -hmm. but if and when it does occur, it will take time and it will need to be very carefully worked through. Do you understand though why some countries are quite intent on breaking or certainly loosening their ties more quickly than that? That's and quite that, a strong sentiment in some parts of the Commonwealth. I, and I of course am a, an, a, simply an observer of that and that will be for each leader in each country to determine their own trajectory. But my observation of the relationship is that that's not necessarily unexpected. Mm -hmm. These are, this is an evolution. And I think what will remain important though is that there will still be bonds between us as Commonwealth nations and there's still things to be gained through those relationships also. Do you think that the Queen's passing will though loosen those links? I mean, she saw so much change, but many of the connections between her and Commonwealth countries were connections that she herself promoted, that she herself encouraged. Do you think her passing weakens that? I can only give an observation from the perspective of New Zealand and that is that a very close affinity and affection for her late majesty um, but an observation is that um, King Charles has visited New Zealand as many times mm -hmm. he's well known in New Zealand uh, he shares many passions and interests that New Zealanders do uh, and I think that means that that relationship already exists it's a transition but it's not a jarring transition for New Zealand. Now one of the reasons that you are well known here is that during the COVID pandemic, you took a very hard line on lockdown and indeed closing the borders. I know that the Queen would call you sometimes to talk during the pandemic. I think we can see a photograph of you having a conversation with her during that period. It's interesting across the world and in the UK, some leaders are starting to reassess some of the harsher measures that were used during the pandemic. Have you reassessed the decisions that you made in your approach? Well, of course, now in New Zealand, the only uh, restrictions that we have are masks and healthcare and, and a requirement just if you have COVID to stay at home. You know, there will be a period of reflection, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. So that means our, our borders are open for any who may have that question in their minds. I think for reflection for leaders around the world will be, how do we prevent pandemics in the future? And what is the, the best response? And we'll go through that process as anyone else will. Um, we have to be willing to look at every decision uh, as, we, as mm -hmm. we go. And we did as we went through the mm -hmm. pandemic. But I still believe we made the best decisions we could with the information we had. We wanted to save lives and the evidence shows we did relative to say a country of the size of Scotland versus New Zealand. Mm. But there were thousands of deaths sadly uh, in New Zealand, 2000. It's interesting, our new Prime Minister though here has said that she would never lock down again. For you, if we end up in a situation which everybody wants to avoid with another pandemic, would a lockdown and border control still be tools that you would consider? Well, I don't see that as the trajectory of this pandemic anymore. Mm -hmm. And so we've said we, we see no scenario in front of us that would lend itself to that. We use lockdowns only as a tool while we waited for our people to be vaccinated mm -hmm. so that we could save lives. And then we began a series of shifts to open ourselves back up again. Mm -hmm. And it's worked. You know, we did save thousands of lives. No response was without pain. I know here in the UK, you had both lockdowns mm -hmm. and lives lost. In New Zealand, relative to other countries, mm -hmm. we were locked down for fewer days and we saved many lives. Well, I'm proud of New Zealand's response. And just finally, as you're here for this enormous event tomorrow with hundreds of other world leaders, um, it's been written that actually this event is so enormous that you're all going to have to take the bus to get there, apart from the American president, Joe Biden. Have you thought about what that's going to be like or, or who you're going to sit next to? Well, I have to be honest, I'm kind of interested that there's so much fuss about it. <laughs> fuss about the bus. <laughs> yes, um, I, don't, I don't think the bus warrants too much fuss. Um, when we came here for Chogham, we used buses for transport back in New Zealand. I, I often get our ministers to carpool in a van. Um, so, uh, look, this just makes good sense. And who do you but want to we're a very practical people. Uh, who do you want to sit next to? Have you oh, decided? Or will you be told who to sit next to? I'll be sitting next to my partner, Clark. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, just into our day. Thank you so much for coming in this morning and being with us on this special day. Thank, Thank you. Take good care. Thank you very much indeed.